All right, Max comes to us tonight from Philadelphia, where he's pursuing an MFA in fibers at Temple University's Tyler School of Art and Architecture. His exhibition, The Sensational Inflatable Furry Divines, consists of five large-scale inflatable sculptures that inflate and deflate at random intervals throughout the day. Wonderfully skillful in their execution, each vibrant form takes on its own personality. The pieces beg to be touched, but their larger-than-life scale also creates a very imposing president. presence. Sorry, Max, we've really loved spending time with each of these characters. Would you like to give us the general overview about the work and your experience creating it? Yeah. Um, yeah, before I, I jump into a quick overview slideshow, um, about the work, I just wanna say uh, thank you to, to you, Doug, um, and to Lauren, who I had also been coordinating with back when we thought this show was gonna happen in April, um, which did not happen. Um, but yeah, thank you, and, and also to the uh, LSC Arts Program at Colorado State University for hosting, for hosting this show. Um, it really is a, a very, very strange privilege to, to have an exhibition right now with the state of the world. Um, I can't really wrap my head around it, honestly. Um, but I'm very grateful for the chance to, to share this work with you all um, and to speak tonight. Um, so with that, um, I will attempt to share my screen. All right, are we rocking? Rocking and rolling? I think so. Okay. All right, so yeah, before jumping into this work uh, briefly, I, I do want to keep this brief because I know you have some really thoughtful, excellent questions prepared that I'm excited to, to talk about. Um, before I, I jump into this, I just want to rewind a little bit to 2016 to, to touch on some of my influences uh, before I was making these works. Um, so some of my major influences uh, were uh, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and, and looking at drag specifically used in um, street performance and protest. Uh, John Waters films like Female Trouble and Pink Flamingos and The Drag Queen Divine, um, who whose namesake is, is, uh, has worked into the, the body of work, the sensational inflatable furry divines. Um, Bread and Puppet, uh, this large scale puppet theater troupe, their work is, is so amazing. If you ever get a chance to go to their museum, which is essentially just this massive old barn full of these huge puppets out in Vermont, I highly encourage you to, to check that out. Um, and also visual artists I was looking at a lot at the time, like Caroline Wells Chandler, um, and of course, working in soft sculpture, there's always going to be some, some nod to Klaus Oldenburg. Um, so those are some influences, but moving into uh, this very influential professional experience um, of moving to Columbus, Ohio in 2016 and working at an inflatable mascot costume company in their inflatable costume department as a stitcher. Um, so we made Sonic here, Michelin Men, um, all kinds of anime characters that were sent out to places in, in China and Japan, um, M&Ms, VeggieTales, all kinds of crazy things. Um, and while I was uh, working at this, at this place, I, I took a ton of materials at the end of every shift. Um, and honestly, I've, I've taken so many, so much scrap material that I'm still working through it. The stuff that's behind me right now, I made in my first year of grad school, which came from the trash cans of this costume shop. Um, and a little fun fact here, I am 5'8", which is the ideal height for the wearers of these costumes. So whenever we would finish these costumes and they'd have to be documented before shipping out, I was asked to model them. So I have worn, I can't tell you dozens of these crazy inflatable mascots. Um, I've been all sorts of characters. Um, this is a, a sneak peek at the designer station, this guy named Jason, who was great. This is a in progress mascot at his, at his station. I would come over to this station constantly throughout the day and, and bugging him to get some tips. Um, 
about projects that I was working on in the studio. So I learned so many incredible techniques during this time, uh, very intricate sewing techniques that I'm still um, using and expanding in, in my work today. Uh, and at the time, I, the, the work that I was doing in the studio, I wasn't, I definitely wasn't thinking of them as, um, as mascots or characters as much as I was thinking of them as sculptural objects. Um, but clearly there was an influence seeping in from, from the job. Um, some early sketches of, of pieces that would later become the first Furry Divines, Luther and Jester. And then it was uh, the process of, of translating my doodles into the inflatable linings um, of these forms that I finally realized that, oh, these things are characters. Um, they're starting to have these kind of personalities that, and, and the scale, the scale of being slightly larger than human size has this very confrontational presence, uh, like what you uh, alluded to in the introduction. So I noticed that making these, these linings and, and really wanted to uh, uh, push that forward. Um, so Jester and Luther, the first, the first pieces in the series that I made in tandem, um, were uh, the beginnings of this process of really embracing uh, the idea of these strange mascots. Um, so from my time working at the costume shop, making mascots whose roles were very clearly defined, which was pretty much buy this product or watch this movie or, or go to this place, um, and were constantly promoting this incredibly happy, upbeat image um, in the interest of, of selling something. Um, making those things in my day job was making me think about uh, what a flawed mascot would look like or a mascot whose purpose is um, less defined or maybe even completely undefined or the, a purpose outside of motivations of commercialism. Um, so with Jester, one of these first ones, I was thinking of him as the sad court jester. Um, I was thinking about uh, performance anxiety, about a mascot that might want attention, but not doesn't necessarily know how to get it or what even to do with it if you were to get that attention. Um, Luther, on, on another hand, um, is a bit of a sloppy mess in my head. <laughs> Um, I think of Luther as, um, well, first of all, he, the, the name reference is, a, is a, a reference to Martin Luther, the monk, um, which mostly emerged after constructing this and realized that the hair cut looked very Martin Luther-ish. Um, but <laughs> I'm hearing them in the other room. It's great. Um, and so Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses. Um, on the door of the church saying that the church needs to stop selling these indulgences, which was a bold, big move. Um, so making this piece, thinking about conviction and boldness um, were uh, going into the characterization of this piece, but also considering when a conviction, what the blurred line is between a conviction and a delusion. Um, not as any kind of commentary on the character of Martin Luther by any means, that was mostly just an aesthetic kind of starting point. But thinking about um, when is the time to, to have conviction and to, and to be very stubborn or bold in our, in our um, decisions and when is the time to consider, consider some alternatives. So this is uh, some planning for one of the next Furry Divines, which I made while in residence at the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Tennessee. Um, and while living in Tennessee, I was constantly confronted with black bears, um, which were all over the place. I witnessed a black bear steal a candy bar out of someone's truck, which totally seemed like a scene from a cartoon, but played out in real life. Um, so the, the onslaught of black bears as this kind of other form of mascot in this particular region was, was seeping into this next furry divine. Um, and to take kind of a side note, this, this image shows uh, a step in my process of uh, translating a doodle into this kind of geodesic dome blueprint. Um, that's something I've done for all of these pieces. 
And that geodesic uh, process is, is a way to utilize small scraps of material that I would get from the dumpsters, some of which would literally be the size of my hand. Um, so as a way to imply a cohesive construction um, by using lots of really small pieces. And here's Solo, uh, Solo finished. So with Solo, I was talking about that, that influence of, of the black bears being all around and being very afraid of running into a black bear um, late at night on my walk from my studio back to my home, which did happen one night at two in the morning. Um, being confronted by alone by a large black bear who was just looking for some trash, but it was very scary. And I did the thing you're not supposed to do and ran, um, but I didn't have very far to go. Um, but anyway, I, I was thinking a lot of that time of, of this bear as the symbol of uh, something fearful, um, but, but ultimately something that I don't really understand and thinking about fear and understanding and desire, being afraid of what we desire, how we can communicate the things that, that we desire but might be afraid to do so. Um, thinking of the practice of like keeping sex toys or lingerie or fetish wear in places that are private or out of sight. Um, so yeah, with Solo, I was thinking a lot about um, how to embrace um, our desires and communicate them. And I have always wanted to make a harness for this piece and I'm, I'm sure I'll do it someday, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Okay, next for Divine Corona. Um, uh, so, uh, um, yeah, the, the planning process for this, some, some sketches, working on the lining. Um, with Corona, uh, which is a very coincidental title, um, not named after the virus or the cheap beer, which um, I was mostly asked at, at openings for this piece, why or what this piece had to do with cheap beer. Um, not named after either of those things. Um, it was conceptualized after the 2017 solar eclipse, which was uh, a very um, amazing experience for me. Um, and thinking about eclipses and black holes, these immense unstoppable forces. Um, and I'm gonna kind of do a little bit of a side note and show some process images. Um, so this is a test inflation. Um, that hole that goes from the front of the piece to the back of it was, was quite a challenge um, for this piece. Um, and so with my process, I make, I make the inflatable lining first and then I make the exterior later, layers. So I essentially make the sculpture twice in different materials, one in nylon rips up and then another in whatever the outer layers are, fur, pleather, um, what have you. And then I join the layers together um, in this very uh, intricate process. Um, this is a look inside of Corona during one of my last uh, test inflations for that piece. Um, so you can see kind of the relationship of the lining to the, to the outer layers. And here is Corona finished. Um, so yeah, thinking about um, eclipses, black holes, immense unstoppable forces, and, and also connecting that idea to my social media usage at the time. Um, I was living in a beautiful place in Tennessee and would occasionally find myself scrolling on my phone thinking, what am I doing here? Um, and so that was it, was, it was at that time that I, I started to research um, social media uh, and the psychological tactics of manipulation that go into the design of, of social media apps, of our phones. There's a, a great unnerving but important documentary that just came out. Um, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the title of it, but it was just, it just came out on, um, Netflix a couple weeks ago. I highly encourage you all to watch that. Um, so, so thinking of this uh, never-ending stimulation um, went into the, the conceptualizing of this piece. Um, let's see. And then moving on to the last Furry Divine, uh, the most recent one that I returned to after, after taking a year off from the series. Um, so this kind of shows a little bit of the increasing role of research that is, is going on in, in my practice. Um, once I'm starting to conceptualize a piece, I start this, 
this list of um, books, movies, visual art that are starting to inform, that I think could inform um, the, the ideas I'm interested in. So with Sabina, um, with this piece, I was considering lots of themes of violence um, and very complicated ideas about violence. Ultimately, I was, sitting, I was trying to sit with and reconcile my love for the horror genre and very campy kind of gory scenes in the horror genre with um, very real feelings of despair and outrage at real um, displays of violence on actual people. So how those two things can coexist within me um, was, was the starting point of this piece. Um, and watching a lot of 80s slasher movies, reading a lot of queer horror theory kind of analysis, thinking about how, um, thinking about the, the transphobia, the misogyny, um, vaginal shame that is, is witnessed in a lot of uh, 70s, 80s horror films, um, but also at the same time how those films can be reclaimed in, in queer interests. Um, and, and overall thinking about, um, and I'll, I'll move on now to the, the piece as it's done, thinking about a bleeding through, um, thinking about the, the more we want to hide something, um, the more that it'll, it'll ultimately eventually rise to the surface. Um, so with Sabina, I wanted to, to imply a slash in this unassuming white form that revealed this red glittery interior that was questionably exposed. Um, it could be a wound or a portal or an emergence of something. Um, I wanted that to be very uh, uncertain. But the, the title, um, Sabina, the name, uh, comes from, is a reference to Sabina Spielrein, who's credited with, with laying the philosophical groundwork of the death drive in her essay, uh, Destruction as the Cause of Coming into Being. And I'll just end here with a couple images of, of them all together and their first exhibition as a group um, over a year ago now uh, at the Yeiser Art Center in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, and, and I'll just end on a note that, that these mascots are, are things that I'm, these, these pieces are things that I'm personifying with very distinct character traits that may or may not come across. Um, but I hope that these pieces can playfully instigate conversation about desire, queerness, embodiment. Um, but my real uh, goal is for someone to approach these things and have a physical relationship. Um, experience of, of their body in relation to this object. So if someone can have that moment and experience something that was unexpected, then that, um, then my goal, I guess, is met. Um, so on that note, uh, that is, is all I have to share with you all now. Um, and there's my contact info. Please feel free to, to reach out with any questions about um, the work or questions about residencies or, or anything. I'm, I'm happy to to connect. So on that note, I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'd love to dive into the questions that that you all have. We have some questions here that have been gathered in the gallery. But for those of you who um, popped in a little late, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Max, please uh, just drop them in the chat uh, and we will kind of round up the, the stragglers and ask them at the end. Thanks. I think our first question comes from Cassandra. Yeah, so first off, thank you, Max, for sharing a lot about your work. We really appreciate it. But to start off the Q&A, I just wanted to ask more about the design process of your work. So thinking about like the reasoning behind the shapes and colors you use as well as the scale of your work? Yeah, um, so the, the process for me um, always starts or it usually starts with with a relationship to material. Um, so I kind of look at the material that I've collected and I start to to make some connections between some things. It might be um, this red glittery material like Sabina's interior kind of shape and the white fur and developing a relationship between those materials. 
um, and then doing material investigations with those things, what it means to have this red right next to a white fur um, and how that can look different um, in, in different arrangements. Um, so it, it, it usually starts with that material investigation. Um, and then uh, from there, I come up with, with uh, the design um, that you saw in, in some of those sketches by just kind of doodling a, a lot, um, doing a lot of different possible things that might touch on um, uh, the ideas that I'm thinking about. So with Sabina's example again, I can't tell you how many different iterations of this like slash through this form that I had sketched um, in so many different ways. Um, so material doodling, um, those are very important uh, processes at the very beginning. To speak to the scale, it's, uh, I like to think of it as a, as a drag queen kind of scale, um, a scale that's just a little bit larger than you and I, I think that there, there's, yeah, there's this very uh, uh, physical relationship that we have with something like that, that's just a little bit bigger than us, that makes us more aware of our own bodies. Um, and that, that kind of response, that, that first response is, is something that I'm trying to get after, is, is a very physical, aware of your own body kind of thing um, that I think, yeah, is, is a very unique experience when it's something that's just a little larger than you are. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so this is Serena. Um, so my question was, does the formation of the sculpture through air inflation rather than a solid base structure add to the meaning of your work? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I think that um, I think that the, the process of in inflation, um, of alternating between these very full kind of erect forms and these um, collapsed forms that, that sort of uh, fall into themselves, I think it speaks to, uh, to the body in, in, a, in a very direct way, um, bodies that are um, um, uh, constantly changing and morphing. Um, so in breathing, I think that it, it has some uh, very tactile, tangible relationships to, to our bodies. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I think that that's, that that's the real importance for me, is having it not be this solid uh, thing. It's, it's this soft, malleable thing that's that's going through processes just like our bodies are. That's very nicely stated. Thank you. Um, what, um, I have two questions in a row to ask you. So what do you think it was through all your experiences as an artist that really drew you to fibers and that, uh, that fiber-based sculptural um, medium over anything else? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting question. Um, to, uh, kind of a, a fun fact is that I, I actually went to school for animation um, and I only lasted five weeks in that program. Um, I, I love drawing. I, I don't consider myself a very good or um, proficient drawer. Um, but, uh, yeah, animation and me just weren't, weren't, weren't a great fit, but it was this, there was one day, um, that I was sitting at my light table trying to animate my hand moving or something, and I looked out the window and I saw, <laughs> I saw the fiber, um, students that were mounting a flag and literally dancing around it, and I just thought, they're having so much fun, and I'm not having any fun, <laughs> and I want to have fun like they're having fun. Um, and literally that week, I, without any plan, really, of why I wanted to go into fibers, um, I met with the department head, and I was like, I think this is the department for me. Um, and on a more, uh, substantial answer, I guess. Um, I love fibers for the tactility of it. Um, I'm a very, I, I 
I constantly need something uh, to do with my hands. Um, I'm a very crafty kind of person. Um, so the, the connection to, to material and, and craft and process um, is, uh, has been really important for me the, as I've been in fiber programs and um, exhibitions, fiber spaces. Um, what else? draws me to fiber. Am I getting a little off of your answer or your question? No, that is a, that's a great answer. I mean, I think we all head towards certain mediums because they call to us in different ways. And I just wanted yeah. to know what yours was. Yeah. Um, my second question is um, being in, in a fibers program and, and pursuing your work through fibers, I'm sure you're, uh, constantly um, addressing the question that, uh, that we seem to be asking a little bit less nowadays, but it's still present about that. Uh, is there a line between craft and fine art? And um, are you intentionally playing with that conversation in any way? Or do you feel like that's a conversation that needs to be had in relation to your work? Yeah, I definitely don't shy away from that that conversation, and I, I um, it, it's a conversation that that happens and um, that comes up constantly in any craft based uh, uh, department or program. Um, I think it's it's when considering the the distinction line relationship uh, between craft and art, I think it is an important thing to have an awareness of um, the politics of that and the history of that. Um, that, that distinction of, of craft and art has been used in a very political way to, to keep a lot of makers out of certain artistic spheres. They tend to be makers of color. Um, they tend to be makers who are queer. Um, they tend to be indigenous makers. Um, so terms like craft and outsider art have been weaponized as a way to, to maintain an art market that is more catered to painting and sculpture. Um, it just kind of, that is how it's been used in the past. I think that there are so many people, and I, I would, I hope, I, I would love to be considered one of those people who um, want to, uh, to push that. I'm definitely not someone who, who I, I work in a fiber program for a reason and, and that is my relationship to craft and process and material. So I by no means would consider myself a, a fine art sculptor, you know? Um, craft is a very important, important thing to me. And I also think that um, the process of continuing to define these things um, seems to be a trap that people fall into where we keep trying to define what contemporary art is. We keep trying to define what craft is. Um, and for me, I, I look to a lot of queer makers who, who use tactics of queerness to say, look, it can be either, both, everything, nothing, um, fuck all of the like preconceived definitions or notions of these things. Um, like make the work you, you love to make and frame it the way you want to frame it and be aware of the histories and the politics behind those things. Um, but um, yeah, I guess I, I just don't want, um, I wouldn't want anybody to be limited by um, a definition as in, in, in a very queer kind of sense. Um, there was a great, there's a, a really great uh, um, writing by Julia Bryan Wilson that we just read in one of my grad classes recently that talks about Harmony Hammond's work, um, who's definitely an, an elder in um, fiber arts. Um, and I would highly encourage anybody to look that up. Um, I can't remember the title, but if you just type in Julia Bryan Wilson, Harmony Hammond, you'll find it. Um, it's great. And, and that's pretty much her stance is that everything can be everything. Everything can be nothing. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. 
wonderful way to say it. <laughs> so going to our next question, we kind of saw that you have a background in creative writing. And now that you're in grad school for visual arts, we were just wondering what the conceptualization process is behind your artistic practice and how creative writing really fits into that. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question for for me personally because I it, it used to be way more um, present in in my practice. Um, like when I was an undergrad and, and shortly after graduating, uh, during that time I would I would constantly be alternating between um, writing and making, and I would start to make something and and I would write about it, whether it was some form of poetry or, um, or short fiction or something, um, I would write and then I would make in response to the writing. And it was this very kind of dual relationship of going back and forth between those modes. Um, and, and honestly, it, it has kind of, um, it hasn't been as present for me um, in the last few years, or at least directly. I think that I'm still very interested in, in ideas of narrative, ideas of character, characterization, personification, um, humor. Uh, I'm interested in implying uh, an, a story or a narrative or, or implying um, uh, the use of an, of an object or its relationship to other objects and how multiple things in, in relationship to each other can, can create a, a narrative. Um, so I, I may not be directly directly writing as as much as um, I used to, but I think that there is a lot that's still at play in my practice that um, echoes uh, the creative writing that I used to do. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so you said that uh, your art um, and like some of the inspiration you get comes from uh, the long history of queer performance artists. And I was curious about like what, uh, you mentioned some, but some specific artists that have inspired you, whether they're performance artists or otherwise, but yeah, which queer artists have inspired you? Um, that, is, that is a great question. Um, and honestly, my, my influences are, are all, over the place, um, they're my, they're in um, in puppetry and theater design and set design, costume design. Um, they're also in fetish wear and and kink equipment. Um, they're in, in nightlife. Um, so the, those are kind of abstract um, uh, ideas. Um, that, that I look to for inspiration. Um, but I also got, get, get a lot of inspiration from fashion, fashion designers. So queer designers like Diego Montoya, um, B. Kala, um, the nightgowns that uh, Catherine Delish makes are exquisite and amazing. And I want one, they're so cool. Um, so yeah, I'm constantly kind of grabbing from the worlds of fashion, um, queer nightlife, uh, puppetry, um, visual artists like, like Caroline Wells Chandler and um, uh, Klaus Holdenberg, um, and just kind of, they're all working together some, some way. Um, there is a, a great book that I recommend called Artificial Hells by Claire Bishop, which goes into a really um, expansive history of, of performance performance art that um, that I was reading around around the time of um, making these pieces in like 2015, 2016. Um, so I, I would recommend that book um, for a specific look uh, more in depth at performance art. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, and we had just one final question from the art staff. Uh, since a lot of us are undergrad art students as well, we were wondering if you had any advice for any of us uh, who are thinking about pursuing an MFA or a residency. Totally. Uh, to be completely honest, that is a whole other talk presentation that I really enjoy um, giving. 
um, cause there, there is a lot in, into those kinds of things. Um, and residencies and MFAs are, um, uh, different, different situations that require different preparedness, um, different goals maybe, um, in terms of a residency, um, practical tips come down to um, an, your application. It comes down to um, having really strong images. Um, with my experience with residencies, that has been the number one thing is having really, really solid images um, and having some detail shots. Um, Artist statements and, and, and writing is, is also a very important thing, having a concise artist statement, um, especially for, for very popular artist residencies that are looking at potentially hundreds of applicants. Um, so having something that is, is direct and gets to your, um, your interests, your goals, and what you're doing, what your work is actually uh, tangibly doing, um, that concise statement can be very, very helpful. Um, in terms of advice about an MFA, I, I kind of feel like I'm not in a, <laughs> in a position to, to give that as someone who's only halfway through it. Um, but I suppose I would give um, the advice, and look, I mean, there are so many ways, so many trajectories in the art world, and, and anybody who tells you one way to do something is, is full of shit. Um, so by no means, um, is this like the only way to go or whatever? But um, I would recommend taking some time off after undergrad um, and, and figuring out how your practice exists outside of an institution, um, figure out how your thoughts um, and um, the work you're making will begin to evolve uh, when you're on your own or when you're in a very different kind of artistic community. I think having that kind of uh, experience can be very helpful going into grad school um, and just giving yourself a little bit more of a, a closer relationship with who you are as a maker um, and, and thinking about your work in a more expansive way. Um, but I mean with that said there are plenty of people I know who are really great artists who went straight into an MFA from their undergrad so um, that is like maybe a suggestion, but you know. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions. Yeah, you're welcome. So we have a couple more questions here in from the chat. Uh, Gregory asks, do you see yourself working more with puppetry? Basically stuff related to this style, but more mobile. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that is something that I've been um, wanting to, to, a direction that I've wanted to push my work more into um, for years now, um, and has been on the back burner. Um, but yeah, I've had uh, several professional uh, uh, experiences, jobs, working with puppet theaters and things, so I've kind of, and I've collected different um, uh, objects that would go into making puppets really easily. So I think I'm just waiting for the right time. My ideas right now are, are a lot more related to, to architecture and space, um, but activating these spaces that I'm creating. And, and I, I have been thinking that puppetry could be a, a good technique to, to do that. So. My interests are absolutely there. Um, I feel like it's only a matter of time. So we'll see. Great. Uh, our next one is from Grace or maybe Grace's iPhone. We don't know who. Uh, have you ever felt limited in your color selection due to supply? Or do you order specific fabric or textiles in addition to what you've collected from the mascot inflatable position? And, and what role does this play uh, in your practice? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, and it, it's something that I think about a lot. Um, 
in in some ways i find that i personally thrive with some level of parameters um so having um having having a, maybe a limited color palette or a limited selection of materials uh I think allows me an opportunity to, to look at the materials I have very closely and critically uh, and how I want to use them. Um, and uh, I also do really want to play with the, uh, um, the color scheme of the, of the materials that I'm using being very manufactured materials like faux fur, that go into mascots, they, they serve a, a certain purpose um, of, of being alluring, bright, colorful, commercial kinds of colors. Um, and I'm interested in playing with that, uh, with, with what's happening there, with colors that are meant to be bright, bold, saturated, meant to draw you in, to pull you into something. I think that there's an interesting mechanic of of those um, manufactured colors that I want to kind of mess with. Um, so that is the uh, justification, I guess, that I've, I've told myself for the materials that I use. To be completely honest, I've, I've collected so many materials um, over the years that I, I do actually have a lot of different colors and, and materials of things. So my inventory is, is constantly growing. Um, but I have been trying to, to challenge myself in, in ways to maybe mess things up a little bit, get things a little, uh, dirty, <laughs> show some, some use or, or some kind of function to an object or some kind of residue. Um, and, and I'm looking at those kinds of strategies, strategies as a way to, to complicate the surfaces a little more. Great. I, I have one last question, and I know it's a totally unfair question, um, <laughs> but I feel like I can ask this question as a, as a parent. I'm allowed to ask this question. Which one of the divines is your favorite? Oh, my God. Oh, man. I think it's Luther. <laughs> All right. Flirty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Well, I, I think we don't have uh, any other questions from the chat. So I will say, yep, I'm right. I will say thanks to everyone who uh, came out this evening or stayed in this evening and joined us. It was great to have you all. Um, thank you, Max, for sharing your work with us and your insights uh, here with us tonight. It was uh, really a great pleasure for me uh, and I'm sure for others. Uh, so with that, we'll say good night. And if you all, if anybody has any questions about the exhibition or the program or anything like that, feel free to reach out to uh, us in the arts program at, um, at our email, which is lsc underscore arts program at colostate.edu or through any of our social uh, outlets. And I'm sure if you have any questions for Max, uh, he'd be happy to, to help you out as well. So thanks Thank all. Feel free to reach out. Uh, thanks everybody and have a great night. Thank you everyone. <laughs>